Good morning and welcome everybody to BC 308, our class on uh, Revelation. And Daniel, we have been journeying through the prophetic scriptures given in the book of Daniel. And uh, so, going to continue that today. Um, may I invite somebody please to pray with us as a class and then we will get started. Could somebody Please pray with us together. Shall I pray fast? Please go ahead, Amni. Father God, we are so very thankful to you for a beautiful morning. We thank you, Father, for teaching us your great mysteries, Father. And Father, as we are in your presence, Father, we seek your wisdom to understand your mysteries, to understand your word, to understand what is about to come, Father. Be prepared for the day of your coming, Father, and to be enriched in your word so that we can give the hope to the world, Father. Use us for your glory as we apply the word to our lives. Help us that this word may richly dwell in us and bring glory to your name and your name only. Bless Pastor. Bless all the students who are here and who would be listening to the lectures. And let all things glorify you in all ways, Father. Help us, guide us, and fill us with your wisdom and favor so that we can accomplish what you have called us to. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. And good morning. Welcome once again. All right. So we are, going, we are uh, in Daniel chapter 9. So I'll just do a quick review. Uh, we'll see if there are any additional questions, and um, then we will move forward. Um, our goal is uh, today, in the two lectures we have, hopefully we'll try to finish uh, the rest of what we need to see in Daniel, and maybe even get into the beginning of uh, at least Revelation chapter 1. Uh, let's see if we can do that today. All right. So, Daniel, the book of Daniel, we, uh, we, and I'll just do a very brief overview. I don't want to go into too many details. Daniel chapter 2, uh, we saw that um, Daniel had, uh, uh, it was a situation where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and, you know, Daniel gave him the dream. Of course, God revealed it to Daniel. Daniel gave him the dream, and he interpreted it interpreted the dream and that dream was the image this he saw this big image and different parts of the image were made of different metals and then daniel interpreted and said you know these are representing different kingdoms that are going to come after you king nebuchadnezzar and he gave the order and then he also said you know there's this huge rock that wasn't carved by man's hands meaning it came from heaven this was a heavenly kingdom which would crush all of this, that means it will crush all the kingdoms of the earth, and it will become a very powerful kingdom, big mountain. So what we said was, Daniel chapter 2 is an outline of what will, is to come. It's like God saying, okay, here's the book cover, but there's you know many more chapters in it, a lot more detail in it. Uh, you know, I'm going to show you. So Daniel chapter 2. Then we come into... Uh, Daniel chapter five, uh, five where um, Daniel you know reads the handwriting on the wall and he uh, tells King Belshazzar at that time, you know, your kingdom is going to be handed over to the Medes and the Persians. And sure enough, that happens. Daniel 5. From Daniel chapter 6 through 12, which is the portion that we've been journeying through. Uh, or, or uh, let's say Daniel 7 through 12, the general portion we'll be journeying through, are Daniel's records of his visions that he had at different points in time. And all of that is recorded for us. So in Daniel 7, uh, Daniel is shedding a vision that he actually had during the reign of King Belshazzar, that means during the Babylonian kingdom and in that vision Daniel 7 is very strange because he sees beasts like creatures animals coming out and uh, you know he sees four different creatures uh, one of the things we have been 
emphasizing is in much of the prophecy here in Daniel and also in Revelation that we will see, uh, a lot of the understanding is given in the chapter or in the book itself. So we don't have to go too far to try to understand what the meaning of the visions that Daniel has had, right? So we could see it right there in the chapter or within the book. Now, uh, we can and we will cross-reference other prophecies. So we can cross-reference Zechariah or Joel or uh, Ezekiel or Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah. And we can cross-reference them and say, hey, they also prophesied about similar things, right? But in understanding the visions, the meaning is essentially in that chapter or even in that book. So in Daniel 7, uh, going back to Daniel 7, Daniel has this vision of the beast. He also sees into heaven. He sees God the Father, the Son of Man, and he sees the kingdoms being handed over. And then the angel interprets, helps Daniel understand, you know, these beasts that he's seeing are different kingdoms. And then he specifies, you know, the, the bear you saw, kingdom of Medes and Persians, then the Greeks, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he's specifying the kingdoms. Daniel chapter 8, which we saw, uh, again, further details about the ram and the goat and, uh, and, and how they're clashing, and then how there is the little horn that comes, and how that little horn then, um, uh, you know, th there are, the little horn comes out of those four empires that come out of um, the, the divisions of the Greek empire. Daniel chapter 8, right? So we saw that. And what is so amazing is when we look back at history, so we have the privilege of looking back at history, we can see that everything Daniel saw into time being fulfilled exactly the way he saw it. And especially when you look at Alexander the Great coming into power, how he takes control of so, so much uh, of the uh, empire moving eastward and then suddenly he dies, and then four other leaders come in his, his place. So we saw that. Then we came to Daniel chapter 9, which we spent time on last week. And um, we, so at, in Daniel 9, Daniel is praying, and he's praying about the prophecy of Jeremiah, saying, okay, the 70 years are coming to an end, so which means that you know we, we are going to be heading back to Jerusalem, as Jeremiah prophesied. And he's praying for the people, he's repenting for the sins. And at that time, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, comes to him and gives him more details. So each and every chapter, as it moves along, is giving more and more detail about things to come. Right? And it's Daniel 9, and we looked at verses 24 to 27. And in this passage, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, is talking to Daniel about 70 weeks and uh, we explained that the term weeks as understood in the old testament is a period a week represents a period of seven years so that's how they understood it and we cross-referenced in Gen genesis 29 verses 27 and 28 where laban when he's telling jacob he says you know i want you to work for a week for uh, uh, Rachel and a week meeting seven years, you know, so you had to work seven years. So that week represents seven years. And so when we look at what Gabriel told Daniel, he said, Look, in these 490 years, two big things are going to be accomplished. And I'm looking at Daniel 9 24, just quickly reviewing, and we'll see if any questions are there. Two big things are going to happen. One, there is going to be the uh, ending or dealing with transgression and sins and iniquity, which is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Then there is also going to be a bringing in, a ushering in of everlasting righteousness, the fulfillment of vision and prophecy, and the anointing of the most holy. That means uh, it's the ushering in of the millennial kingdom and it's the establishing the fulfillment of age of prof all the prophetic scriptures pointing to the end of the age and 
Christ the Lord being anointed or set up as king. So two major things. So he says, Gabriel explains, 62 plus 7, that is 69 years, 483 years, 69, 69 times 7, 483 years, will elapse from the time there is the command to go back and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah comes. Right? And then the Messiah is going to be killed or crucified. And, uh, and uh, that's verse 26 of Daniel 9. And uh, then the city is going to be destroyed. That's Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And till the end, there'll be war and desolations in and around Jerusalem. So we saw 483 years. Now, remember that, you know, okay, so if, if you read um, historical accounts and so on, the dates are disputable, meaning, uh, you know, the, the, the dates that we have of historical periods are only estimates. Uh, that um, historians have made based on you know what they could find, and sometimes it's a single historian who makes those dates, and everybody has agreed to that and gone by it, and so on. So uh, historically, uh, a, a date given by, for especially for the the Medes and the Persians, those em those empires, that period of time, there is a dispute on those dates. Right. So you you will read if you read online or read in books, there'll be this dispute on the dates, uh, five thirty nine BC. So there's a there's a dispute of about I don't know fifty sixty years something like that. But I wouldn't you know I wouldn't worry about it simply because remember the historians who estimated those dates they actually lived in a different period of time. So somebody living in the AD was estimating dates of the BC period and everything's an estimation that basically okay approximately this is when the king lived and this is when he died and so on so there is that okay different 50 60 some years don't worry too much about it this is it what the angel Gabriel told Daniel Daniel 483 years so precisely that time things were fulfilled King Cyrus issued the decree, go back and rebuild. Jesus Christ came. We will go by this account for 83 years. Historians may argue there's a gap of 50, 60 years or like this, that. Um, uh, you know, we're not worried. Yeah, and as he says, comment, you know, the difference in the calendar systems, that's all of that there. So it's all an estimate. But this prophecy, the fact is, it was fulfilled. There was a command. To go back to rebuild Jerusalem. Jesus came and he was crucified. Right? So we see that. So that takes care of 69 weeks or 483 years. Then there's one week left, right? Because he said, I'm going to talk to you about 70 weeks. One period is seven years left. So that week, one period, is suddenly is from the time the Messiah came and Jerusalem was destroyed, that last seven years is towards the end of the age. You see, on what basis do we say it? Because he set things up from chapter 2. He said, in the days of those kings, there will be God setting up his kingdom. That means he's taking, he's saying, you know, what I'm going to show you is from now, that is Nebuchadnezzar's time, all the way till God is setting up his kingdom. So that's a huge span of time, right? That he set that up in chapter 2 itself. And then we see repeated in 7 and 8 that there are things that are things that are happening in the short and near term. And then there is this prophecy of this Antichrist. This man will come, will speak great, uh, you know, pompous things against God and speak against the prince of the princes and all of that. Where does that fit in? Right? So we can see here that, that uh, in Daniel chapter 9, 
Angel Gabriel is saying, you know, that that thing about this this man who will come and will speak all those pompous things, that's in this last seven years, the last seven year period, right? Because we can see that verse Daniel nine twenty seven. Then that means there's a gap from the time the Messiah is cut off and the city is destroyed and the sanctuary is destroyed as the temple is destroyed. There's a gap between Daniel 9.26 and Daniel 9.27. Then this man is going to come. Daniel 9.27. He's going to confirm a covenant for with many for a week, one week. So this is the last week he's talking about. This man comes and he's going to be around for that one week. Seven year period, right? What's he going to do? He's going to have a covenant. He's going to put up a, you know, in, in our modern language, we'll say a peace treaty or a peace accord. He's going to have a covenant for one week. But in the middle of the week, that means three and a half years, he's going to do something. He's going to stop the sacrifices, the offering, and he's going to move very fast doing abominations. And he's going to make desolate. He's going to destroy, be very destructive. In what he does until the end, the end of the seven year period when the time has been determined. So, this passage, Daniel 9 26, 24 to 27, is very, very amazing because he's talking about two big things that are going to be established the sacrifice for sins, bring an end to iniquity, and the ushering in of that everlasting kingdom, righteousness. And the anointing of the most holy. Two major things. And it's going to take place in what he says is 70 weeks. But there is this big gap in between them. And the first part was fulfilled precisely. Everything he said was fulfilled. Therefore, we can look with absolute confidence for that last one week and the things that he said in that last one week to be fulfilled okay so quick review uh, any questions so far on anything we've seen in Daniel before we start off in chapter 10 Kung please go go ahead um pastor like uh, you were uh, in sorry in Daniel chapter 9 verse uh, 26 mm -hmm. sorry 20 uh, 25, uh, when you were explaining about like how, uh, uh, and then before that, to say how you were explaining about like uh, historians are kind of like uh, uh, estimating the time and all that. But uh, I'm asking like, uh, couldn't the, I mean, like the Jewish people, they uh, study, uh, they consider Daniel as a prophet and they, uh, I think they read the, uh, this prophecies and all that couldn't they know like uh, what time uh, the messiah would come and also like uh, some of them they don't uh, they don't uh, think that the messiah ha uh, ha uh, has come yet like they, they still uh, are believing that uh, the messiah will come like and i just want to know like how uh, how could they the jewish people some of them like still not believe that um the Messiah has not yet come, like, because uh, it, it says, like, uh, in verse 25, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, right, like, uh, in verse 25, uh, there shall be uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. Uh, mm. And then in that verse, like, I'm just <laughs> thinking, like, how uh, couldn't the Jewish people... Uh, know that Jesus is the Messiah uh, according to all the prophecies and all of that and like uh, why don't they uh, believe that uh, I mean according to this prophecy for us now it's like very clear uh, of how the timeline it is because you give us like the outline of all of this like for the but for the Jews like I'm just wondering. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know if I made it clear, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I can think of two reasons. Uh, I, I will mention two reasons. One is a 
practical and one is a spiritual. So the practical is, uh, when you read all of these scriptures, you, you see that the Messiah is coming to set up a kingdom. Right? So their expectation is, or what they were looking for, and which they continue to look for is, hey, the Messiah is going to come, but he's going to set up a kingdom. He's going to be king, which is there in Daniel chapter 7 and other places. So that was one of the things they were looking for. And in fact, even the disciples of Jesus were looking for that. You know, in, in Acts chapter 1, this is after his resurrection. The last question the disciples of Jesus ask Jesus is, Lord, will you at this time set up the kingdom? So they were still like, okay, fine. Jesus died on the cross. They said, okay, maybe this wasn't the Messiah because, hey, he died. Uh, no kingdom. You know, we're still under the Romans at that, at that time. Right? And so they're all just disillusioned that Jesus appeared to them and, you know, he showed himself alive many times. And then they were convinced, yeah, Jesus is alive. But in their minds, still one question. You're supposed to be king. You're supposed to set up the kingdom. Where is that? You know. So the point is, the Jews, when they are looking for the Messiah, among many things, they are looking for someone who's going to set up the kingdom. So, you know, they could therefore take this 483 years and uh, that that we've we've understood uh, and just you know reposition it in different ways and 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 then say okay you know we're still looking forward for the messiah maybe these 483 years uh represents you know not just how, how we explained it like you know seven weeks uh, so each week representing seven years they could just explain it some other way uh, because they're trying to put it all together and say hey one man is going to come and he's going to be king you know for example they say you know Unto us a son, a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He, uh, he will be given the throne of his father David, and he will, unto the increase of his government or his kingdom, there will be no end. So they are looking for somebody like that. Right? And Jesus doesn't fit that yet. Because he came, first time he came, to deal with sin, to put away iniquity, to deal with transgression. He's going to come again to bring in usher and righteousness and to fulfill all prophecy and to be anointed as the most holy. So in our mind, it's clear that there, are, there is a, you know, like a two-part or two-stage fulfillment. But they disqualify Jesus because they don't see the second part being fulfilled in him. And their expectation is for everything to be fulfilled at the same time. So that's one problem. The second problem is a spiritual problem. Where, so that's a practical thing. They're looking for that, a king, king and a kingdom. Um, the second problem is a spiritual problem where the apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and then he kind of leads that into... Uh, leads into chapter 4, he says, you know, when the Jewish people are reading the scriptures, the Old Testament, it's like there's a veil upon their eyes. You know, so they read the scriptures, and it's like they're blinded. They can't see. They're reading the scriptures, but they can't see that the scriptures are actually pointing to Jesus. And even during Jesus' time, you know, he, he rebuked the religious leaders of his time. Uh, the the Pharisees and the scribes, and he said, you know, you search the scriptures. He's telling them, search the scriptures, because they are they which testify of me. You know, so they were they were scholarly people. They had read the scriptures. That's what qualified them to you know be in that position of leadership. But yet they could not see that the scriptures were pointing to Jesus. So there's a spiritual problem. Um, 
they're blinded. And then Paul leads into chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, says the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. But Paul also tells us that that, that blindness, that veil is taken, is removed, when the heart turns to the Lord. And so uh, the light of the gospel has to shine. And when they receive that understanding, then they can see the glory of God in the person of Christ. So two problems, the practical and then there is the spiritual. Okay. Any other questions till chapter 9 of Daniel? All right, so let's move forward then. In chapter 10, um, there isn't um, too much of, uh, um, you know, a new, uh, wish, uh, new information there. I'll just point out. So what, what we see in chapter 10 is that uh, we are given a window into the unseen world. Right, so Dan Daniel is has been really troubled um, by this vision, and um, and and he says, uh, you know, he's 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 in this time of just uh, prayer, and you know, he's praying on uh, for twenty one days, and uh, he's he's really in a good way disturbed by the vision because he's trying to understand, it's like, what does all this mean? You know, I'm trying to. You know, you can try to imagine Daniel's trying to, you know, what we would say, wrap his mind around all that God has been showing him. And so he's been very disturbed. And uh, in a good sense, I'm not saying, you know, he's a, in, in a bad way, but in a good way, he's, he's trying to seek out. He's trying to understand what this means. And so he's seeking God. And at this time, Gabriel comes back to him and uh, speaks to him. And I'll just zero in of, uh, uh, on a few things here in, in Daniel 10. Uh, uh, the first of all, I'll just point out verse 14. So please follow with me. Daniel 10, verse 14, Gabriel says, I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Okay, so he's come to help Daniel understand what will happen to your people. That means specifically, we're talking about the Jewish people. We're talking about the nation of Israel. So he said, look, I've come to help you understand. This is very specific to your people, your nation. In the latter days, that means it's going to happen way out in the future, many of these things. Right? So he's talking about things to come. So Daniel, uh, Gabriel has come to speak to Daniel about that. But in Daniel chapter 10, we also get an insight into this, what's happening, the dynamic of the unseen world. So Daniel has been praying for 21 days. And then, you know, Gabriel says in verse 12, he says, it says, do not fear, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand, to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. But, verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. All right. So in that one verse, verse 13, is some tremendous insight into the spiritual world. Okay, so, I'm, so it's it's not necessarily, so in chapter 10, we're not looking necessarily looking at the prophetic scriptures, we're just looking at the spiritual world. What has been happening, what is happening. So the angel is telling, Angel Gabriel says, you know, Daniel, when you started praying, God immediately sent me. So there's, there's, 
it's not like God delayed or God was just waiting for you to pray and pray and pray and then he will answer your prayer. No. From the time you began to seek God for understanding, God sent me to bring you this, you know, to come to you and talk to you. But there was some interference. There was some uh, obstacle on, along the way in the spiritual world. He talks about the kingdom, verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Then he also mentions, verse 13, the end of that verse, the kings of Persia. So, prince, singular, chief, the kings, plural. So what happened? This angel, Gabriel, he was coming to bring the message to Daniel. But there was the prince and the kings of Persia who opposed him or were uh, blocking him, trying to prevent him. So now, obviously, these are not earthly kings. We're not, we're not talking about some, you know, King Cyrus or King or Darius or you know we're not talking about those physical kings. We're talking about these demonic powers over this region, particularly here in this case. He specifies it says it's Persia. So over that region, there were demonic powers operating. There was a prince that means the main person, oh not person, main demon power in charge and there were kings meaning other rulers under this prince right so it's, it 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 parallels what the apostle paul wrote in ephesians 6 we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against rulers of darkness against spirits of wickedness in the heavenly realms so look there's a there's a hierarchy in the heavenly realms on the spiritual world of demonic powers and so that's kind of you know that's very nicely or we have a beautiful insight into how that is how the dynamic of what's happening here in daniel 10 and verse 13. so these demonic powers were and and the other thing we can say is that they they are um, they operate according to territory. They are, uh, you know, they have geographic assignments, or they're assigned to various territories. So there are these princes, there are these, there's kings, and there's a hierarchy of demonic powers that are operating over different regions, territories, geographic territories. So these demonic powers are opposing Gabriel from getting through. Daniel was just continuing in prayer, and then we see. Michael, I'm, I'm still at looking at Daniel 10, 13. Michael, one of the chief princes. So on, 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 on the heavenly angel side, that is God's side, God, the angels of God, they also have hierarchy. You can see Michael is one of the chief princes. It means there's other chief princes, others who are of that same rank. So Michael, and uh, we associate Michael as a warring angel, uh, Gabriel as a messenger angel. So Michael comes to Gabriel's assistance and helps make a way past these demonic powers, and then he gets through to Daniel. So verse 19, he says, O man, greatly beloved of God, uh, peace be to you, and he was strengthened. And look at verse 20, 21, and let's just read a few verses here. He says, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? So he's saying, okay, now you know why I've come to you. And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. When I've gone forth, indeed the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except my, Michael, your prince. 
Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And I will tell you the truth. I'm looking at Daniel 11 verse 2. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far greater. So now he's this time he's talking about earthly kings. Daniel 11, 2. He's talking about earthly kings. But in Daniel 10, verse 20, he says, I must return. As I'm going back, I'll have to press through the prince of Persia, whom he has already referenced in 18. And he talks about the prince of Greece, the principality, the power over that region, Greece. That that person is also going to get involved. Yeah, not a person, but that demonic power is also going to get involved. And he says in verse 21, Daniel 21, it's Michael, your prince. So that means Michael, who is one of the chief angelic beings has been assigned to Israel your prince he is going to help me overpower these other two principalities that is the prince of Greece and the prince of Persia so very interesting insight into the spiritual realm that there there are demonic powers uh, we're talking about angels that are contending against each other right there are the powers of darkness and there are angelic angels of God, and there is that conflict happening or resistance happening, right? Um, now, we don't think about it very often, but this is a beautiful insight into that realm, the unseen realm. Okay, so that's what we uh, that's just a, you know, a side note from chapter 10. But in terms of prophetic scriptures, verse 14 of Daniel 10, Gabriel is saying, I'm come to speak to you about your people. I'm going to come to speak to you about things that are referred to many days into time. Okay. Are you all with me so far? Okay. Now, we... Yes, Pastor. Okay. All right. Thank you. So now we are going to move into chapter... 11. Now, chapter 11 of Daniel, Daniel is a very interesting chapter. It's also a very powerful chapter in terms of prophecy, but it's also uh, something that extends over a long period of time. Okay, and so you can see in, uh, and, and I would point you to the uh, PDF notes that I've shared with you of Daniel 11, um, where there are different kingdoms. Basically, starting from that time, he's take uh, Gabriel is taking Daniel through the succeeding kingdoms that would come, and pointing out what certain kings and kingdoms will do. All right. So I'm going to um, I'm going to share the PDF and, and and just use the PDF as a reference as we go through. Um, chapter 11, right? So, chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, he is mentioning about verse 2, Daniel 11, verse 2, right? Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter because it is very long. There's about 45 verses in Daniel 11. And a lot of it is um, about certain kings and what would those kings do, different empires. So um, I will just kind of break it down according to the notes and we'll just kind of go through it that way. Uh, so please follow with me here. So Daniel 11, 1 to 4, right? Here he's talking about three more kings who will arise in Persia and the four shall be far richer than, than them all by his strength through his riches. He will stir up all against the realm of Greece. So he's saying, okay, in your Persian kingdom, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be Cyrus, and then there's going to be three more kings. Now, all of this is historically valid, or that means has been validated exactly. All right, so there were four kings, and I'm just mentioning the names here. We're not going to, going to get into the history of the Persian Empire, but it's validated, right? 
and there are he's saying yeah there are three more kings will arise the fourth will be uh, uh, coming uh, will be the you know the most powerful most uh, influential of them all and uh, then was a mighty king shall arise uh, verse 3 who shall rule with great dominion do according to his will and when he has risen his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven so these Persian kings will go against Greece that's verse 2 end of verse 2 and then a mighty king will arise that's verse 3 Alexander the Great right he will arise okay and he's gonna rule and when he's risen his kingdom will be broken up and divided towards the four winds so that's what happened after he came into power his kingdom was divided and given to his four generals right so the uh, he did become great, he did become powerful and rule, but then we saw earlier that he was suddenly cut off, he died very young, and his kingdom was divided, and so on. And But what is interesting is in verse 4 he says, but not among his posterity. That means none of his descendants took over. It's very interesting, even that detail has been given. Right. So this great king who would come, that's Alexander the Great from Greece, he would be very powerful, but his kingdom will be broken. It won't be given to his descendants. It would be just divided into four parts, and we see that happen. Okay. And then verses 5 to 32, so that's a long passage, chapter 5 verse 32 chapter 5 to chapter verse 5 to 32 of chapter 11 he's talking about the south and the north the south with reference to egypt there's an empire there and then the north referring to syria referring to the seleucid princes so there are two different empires from the south and from the north and how they're going to engage with each other. So that's spelled out for us here from verse, verses 5 to 32. Right? Um, and, and, and historically, you know, you could look into all these. And remember, all these dates are approximate, but historically, these are the different rulers of these two dynasties from the north, uh, from the north, from the south. And you could see. How they engaged with each other, and you know, you can trace them through based on what they did and what Daniel had been given information. What is interesting here is um, the pointing out of um, the king. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, so Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, um, he he was a very wicked king so that's in verses 21 uh, to 32 so he was a very wicked king and uh, he you know he did very harsh things against the jewish people verses 21 to verse 32 right and uh, he uh, he also came and he uh, desecrated uh, the the sanctuary. Uh, he did terrible things against um, the Jewish people. So that was also fulfilled. Verses twenty one to thirty two, right? Um, as as uh, Gabriel had given information to Daniel. Then Gabriel starts talking about a willful king starting there in verse 36. Now, bit, verse 32 to verse 35 is talking about the Jewish people, how they withstood the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, how they withstood that he, that in spite of all the you know evil things Antiochus Epiphanes did, 
there were certain Jewish people who stood strong, who you know who were bold, and you know during his his time they 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 stood firm. So that's verses thirty two to thirty five, and then from verse thirty six we start seeing something different coming out. We start seeing him talking about a king who's going to speak blasphemies against the God of gods. Okay, so from verse 36 onwards, it helps us connect back to some of the things we read in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, about this man who's going to come. Towards the latter times, in the last seven year period, this little horn, and one of the common or repeated characteristics is, this man is going to speak blasphemies against God. So you don't find that mentioned, or you don't find that being stated about all these other kings that, you know, that in the kingdom of the north and the south and all those kings, how they're going to fight with each other. None of those things are stated. So this trait of speaking blasphemies against the prince of the princes, against the prince, against the god of gods, is very specific in the book of Daniel. 7, 8, 9, and now in chapter 11, to this little horn, to this man who moves on the wings of desolation, or wings of abomination, and who causes desolation, very specific to that king, or that man, or that ruler. So we see that beginning in verse 36 of Daniel chapter 11. Okay? So we'll go for a break now, and when we come back, we're going to pick up in verse 36 and, 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 and just look at that, because that we can see a clear shift in what Gabriel is saying. Saying, look, all these kings are going to come, they're going to fight with each other, and uh, there's going to come one king, uh, and he's going to really attack the people, he's going to desecrate it, you know, the, he's going to defile the sanctuary, the fortress, and all of that he's going to do. But the people are going to withstand him. Then, verse 36, there's a change. Okay, so we'll pick up with that then, and I will go from there. Okay, let's take a break, and I uh, will come back and pick up in Daniel chapter 11, from verse 36.